started in a second here. Um, we are just waiting for everyone to come in from the hold room and then we will get started in just a minute. All right, Leslie, let's go ahead and get started. All right, um, good afternoon. Uh, I wanna welcome you and thank you for joining the first of the series of webinars hosted by the LWCF Coalition, breaking down LWCF by subprogram throughout the next few months um, and offering a window into the behind the scenes of project development, program mm -hmm. specifics and future opportunities for funding and partnering. Uh, my name is Leslie Kane and I am chair of the LWCF Coalition and on behalf of the thousands of groups in the coalition on the nearing anniversary of the passage of the Great American Outdoors Act, I wanna thank you all for making full dedicated permanent funding a reality. Um, I will kick us off today with a brief introduction on the state of play, as well as some of the current issues facing decision makers in Congress and the administration and how that's shaping our coalition's work and that of our agency partners and others. Um, then we will hear from three organizations working on the ground who will shed some light into the project development and the best ways to engage in that process. Uh, they include Markel Smith, Landscape Partnership Manager at the Nature Conservancy <clears throat> in Massachusetts, Christine Quinlan, Colorado Associate Director at the Conservation Fund, and Becky Bremser, Director of Land Protection for Save the Redwoods. Maybe I should. Um, and if folks can mute, if they're not talking, that would be great. Um, in the second half of the session, you'll hear from Alan Front of Conservation Pathways, who will host a roundtable with DOI agency partners, Cam McClay, the National Park Service, Eric Alvarez at Fish and Wildlife Service, and Karen Montgomery with the Bureau of Land Management. And they will discuss the ins and outs of each of the programs we're covering today. Um, so without further delay, let's get started. Um, first, uh, uh, let's cover some highlights of what full funding means looking ahead. And I would just say, <clears throat> simply put, uh, that guaranteed consistent annual funding is a game changer. Um, it provides that level of certainty and the ability to plan ahead for landowners, states, local governments, and federal agencies, and also the ability to leverage private matching funds. And it's worth noting that um, oftentimes, even when private matching funds are not required, um, LWCF is, is leveraging those kinds of dollars. Um, it's important also to talk about LWCF in, its, uh, in the ways in, that it diversely gets to every corner of this country. It is 10 programs under that umbrella of uh, the major program, and it goes to every corner of the country from every state to every congressional district to 98% of counties thus far. Um, we are hopeful, hopeful that we will able to be able to say 100% in the near future. Um, in addition, among many other things, full funding will help support the administration's America the Beautiful initiative, conserving public and private lands and waters, working with federal, state, local and tribal partners, um, improving equitable access to the outdoors um, from inner cities uh, to rural areas and protecting climate resiliency across landscapes. Um, you're gonna hear today about collaboration and partnerships and the incredible amount of work that goes on uh, on the ground to protect these special places. And I'll just note that they are all locally driven projects. Um, in addition, uh, protecting working lands. So you may hear today from Eric uh, about some ranch land protection um, and easements that are happening in, in uh, the West. Um, but there's also a very successful forest uh, lands program, the Forest Legacy Project Program that's keeping jobs in the woods, increasing recreational access, protecting America's water resources, and strengthening local economies. Um, so working lands are a very critical piece of the overall program. Um, so let's look at how this uh, is all gonna happen. Um, if we could go to the next slide, that would be great. Um, so what you're looking at here is a slide of the framework that Congress laid out when it passed the Dingle Act. So that passed obviously the year before the Great American Outdoors Act. And it shows that suite of 10 programs under the umbrella of LWCF 
and the minimum funding guarantees that Congress ensured. So on the left-hand side, you'll see the four land management agencies. That guarantee is 40% every year for the, all of those uh, projects inside the boundaries of our parks, forests, wildlife refuges, and, and Bureau of Land Management units, and 40% to the suite of state and local grant programs, um, a guarantee of 40% to all of those programs every year. What remains, that 20%, will be flexibly uh, divided depending on program and project needs decided by current and future administrations and Congresses. Um, so today the circle is around the three of those programs that we are gonna focus on, the National Parks, Fish and Wildlife Service and BLM, and um, in future webinars, we'll cover some of those other uh, sub-programs. Um, so let's go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is uh, a look at the process and timing. And as many of you know, not much has changed in that regard. Um, the overall process for allocations and project selection um, sort of re re is, is retained, but what's really important is that guarantee of annual funding that won't change. Um, so it starts with the president's budget submission, which came to the Hill on May, of, May 28th, um, then goes to the Interior Appropriations Committees. Um, as folks know, the House marked up their bill on July 1st. Um, they, were, they are able to move some of the dollars around amongst the allocations of the various programs and projects um, as long as they stay within that 40-40-20 framework and the House did do uh, a little bit of uh, moving around of those dollars. The bills will then go obviously to their respective floors, to conference, and then to the president when the money will sort of flow out to all the communities. Um, so let's move on to uh, the next slide, which is issues and opportunities uh, facing decision makers. Um, as many of you know, LWCF, now that it's mandatory, um, like Medicare and Medicaid, is subject to sequestration. So there was an, a 5%, 5.7% uh, uh, across the board cut to the program, which is a total of $51 million. What that does is put a squeeze on all of those unmet needs throughout each one of those programs, and it's a shortfall You know, we'd like to find ways to address going forward. Um, second, with the emergence of earmarks, uh, Congress uh, uh, has the opportunity in the appropriations process for community project funding. And the House bill did include a couple of earmarks, um, including one on a project that you'll hear about in the next session, Silvio Conti Refuge. Um, one really, really important uh, priority for the coalition and our champions this year was to end the practice of rescissions, which is taking some of that old unused dollars and um, moving them off to other purposes. What we favor instead is reprogramming those dollars back into LWCF um, for the many growing needs. And we are really happy to report that there were no rescissions in the House bill. We're hopeful that the Senate will follow suit. Um, and it's worth noting that 192 uh, bipartisan members in the House supported that through a letter, as well as 46 bipartisan members in the Senate. Um, and that's really important because as I've mentioned, LWCF, even with full funding, is oversubscribed. And one very clear example of that is the $190 million of supplemental federal agency projects and forest legacy projects that were submitted. These are ready to go projects that came along with the president's budget, the FY22 budget. And these unmet needs are just a fraction of the overall backlog in every state and county across this country. Um, so we, again, are working to try to figure out the shortfall and, uh, and really just address that pent up demand. Um, and uh, it's important to know that the 900 million is a floor, not a ceiling. In fact, last year, Congress provided $919 million for the program. So let's go to the next slide, please. Um, so what can you do to help with this effort? Uh, well, there's a numbers of, number of things. We hope that you'll be able to work with Congress to ensure that the most conservation and recreation dollars going to the program by the time the president signs the bill. Um, and you can do that by supporting the individual projects and the overall program levels, telling the stories of how these dollars are impacting your communities and promoting healthy economies. Um, reach out and work with your federal agency partners, those of uh, um, whom are on this uh, webinar today, local, regional, bureau, and department level to see how you can be helpful. Um, engage with the coalition. We will continue to be working on successful implementation um, we're here as a resource uh, to, to know how we can best help you in your work on the ground. Um, and we just rolled out a project toolkit on our website that you should take a look at with resources and information on each subprogram, including project eligibility, grant application timelines, agency contact information, and much, much more. 
Um, so I'm gonna end here and pass it on to my distinguished colleagues who are working at the local level on projects for a window into that process and how best to partner. And we will start that panel with Markel Smith. Uh, Markel, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leslie. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Markel Smith. I'm the Landscape Partnership Manager with the Nature Conservancy in Massachusetts. And I also chair a regional conservation partnership uh, called the Friends of Conti. Uh, the Nature Conservancy really values our partnership with the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the Silvio O'Conti National Fish and Wildlife Refuge. Uh, just to ground you a little background here, um, the US Fish and Wildlife Service's uh, Northeast region is headquartered in Massachusetts. Uh, and as you know, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service administers the National Wildlife Refuge System. And here in New England, we're really fortunate to have the Silvio O'Conti National Fish and Wildlife Refuge right in our backyards. Um, this is a unique refuge. It encompasses the entire 7.2 million acre Connecticut River watershed and includes four states, Vermont, New Hampshire, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. Uh, it's a diverse refuge. It's home to some of the most intact and climate resilient landscapes that contain some of the largest stores of carbon in New England, and also to 2.4 million residents, 84% of whom live in cities. Um, since its first acquisition in October of 1997, the Conti Refuge has protected almost 40,000 acres across all four of those watershed states. Um, and received almost $29 million in funding from the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Um, so the Nature Conservancy and the Conti Refuge have partnered for the last few decades to protect large acreages in all four watershed states. And some of these are listed under those protection highlights on this slide. Uh, we've also worked together on other initiatives like the designation of the Connecticut River as the first national blue way, and also on, on national issues like advocacy for LWCF, what your coalition, what this coalition has been so successful doing for so many years now. Um, so, so thanks again for all of, all of this work and next slide, please. So uh, as a project manager uh, working on conserving land, I'm constantly thinking about the best partner to own and steward the land, whether that's a federal or state agency or a municipality or a land trust. Um, we have a really valuable partner here um, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Conti Refuge, and we also have shared land conservation priorities. So these are places that rank highly for climate resilience, those that provide um, critical wildlife habitat, and also are important for people to get outside. Um, these are places where both, uh, both partners would like to see the land conserved by working with willing sellers. So it's been really critical to get to know um, and develop a good working relationship with the service and with the Conti Refuge. Um, trust is a key component of that. Uh, and I'm so pleased to say that by working together over the years on many projects, we've built that. Um, and we've been able to protect more acres as a result. And our successes have been that much greater and more rewarding. Um, so in terms of how we work together, this is sort of an outline of how we might provide assistance with projects. Um, it really spans the gamut here. Um, we work with willing sellers um, and, and we figure out sort of, you know, how to work together. And that depends on who knows the landowner best, um, timing requirements, how, you know, when to close, availability of funding is key always. Um, sometimes we just make an initial introduction to the landowner as the Nature Conservancy. Other times we might step in and commission an appraisal or uh, fund a survey uh, to get things going. Um, sometimes we introduce other local land trust partners um, to our federal partners to try and make that connection. Um, and then some in some cases we purchase the land um, the Nature Conservancy outright with the intent to transfer it uh, to the federal government at a, at a later future date. Um, so a lot of the land acquisition work uh, we do is also dependent here on the Conti Refuge receiving LWCF funding. And we rely on a regional conservation partnership that I mentioned, the Friends of Conti, um, to advocate uh, for the refuge and to make sure um, the refuge receives a reliable annual allocation of, of those funds. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the Friends of Conti 
um, is a real true coalition of more than 70 public and private organizations and individuals that work in this four state Connecticut River watershed. And the, the Friends was formed in 2005. And really uh, the Friends play a critical role in connecting uh, the refuge with the land, water and trail opportunities that are the most critical and timely because we have this sort of shared goal of strengthening the health of the watershed and the people that live in and are served by it. Um, so this, the Friends was actually chaired for more than a decade by Kim Lutz um, and has directed millions of land and water conservation funds to priority land projects in the watershed. Um, so just to throw out a few numbers, that's um, that's over um, over the past 15 years, the Friends have worked to direct $32 million for key land acquisition projects. And those have added 13,000 acres to the refuge. And really what's interesting too is leveraging the leverage that that's um, given to partners working in this watershed who've been able to conserve more than 350,000 acres elsewhere in the, in the watershed. So, um, so it's been a really nice partnership in that way as well. Um, the Friends is led by an executive team, and that team has uh, representatives from many organizations, including some I know who are here today, uh, Kestrel Land Trust, the Connecticut Audubon Society, Wyndham Regional Commission in Vermont, Appalachian Mountain Club, Springfield Museums in Massachusetts, and the Friends of Pondicherry in New Hampshire. Um, we all have different missions and project priorities, but the real strength of this, this friends group, this coalition has been in coming together to advocate for each other's work because we see it as all contributing to the goals we have within the, the larger watershed. And um, that is true of the refuge as well. It's really that shared vision um, that, that really makes us effective as a coalition. And we've been more effective working together um, so the way we work together, I'm just going to highlight quickly here um, a few a few ways we do that. Um, so we create an annual lookbook or pretty book, and this map that's shown on this slide is is taken from that book. Um, the FY2223 um, lookbook was really it's really an opportunity to showcase all of the project opportunities in the watershed. So this this FY2223 lookbook showcased 55 projects, which total approximately 25,000 acres valued at $45 million that could be completed over the next two uh, fiscal years in the watershed. Um, these are land acquisition projects, but really the other thing the friends is looking forward to doing is creating another lookbook that showcases um, non-acquisition projects like trail projects, restoration projects, aquatic connectivity projects, and, and also doing something similar. And the way this lookbook is, or pretty book as some people call it, is used is to um, really circulate this among legislators. It's also used um, by Fish and Wildlife Service internally to highlight um, the projects that are possible uh, within the, the refuge. Another thing uh, the friends do, we circulate dear colleague letters in the House and Senate on behalf of the Conti Refuge, urging, um, urging members to support LWCF appropriations each year for the refuge. And then this, um, this picture here on this slide is actually um, relates to this creating, um, creating opportunities with local legislators. So um, one thing we've, the Friends have been successful at doing is really to um, create and maintain these relationships. That's um, Representative Jim McGovern here from Massachusetts. Um, he's shown a, on a site visit with us at the Fort River Division in the Conti Refuge. And over the years, uh, Rep McGovern has been a true friend of the Friends. He's an ardent supporter of the work of the Conti Refuge. Uh, he led a letter in full support um, in support of full funding of LWCF, and he spoke on the floor about the importance of the Conti Refuge. So um, we've also been able to take him out and, uh, and others out um, to really highlight some of the project successes locally on the ground. So it's been, um, been some exciting work that the Friends has done. So I don't want to take up any more time, but just want to say thank you for the opportunity uh, to share more about uh, TNC's work with the Conti Refuge and Fish and Wildlife Service. And I'll hand things over now to Christine. Good morning, everyone. I'm Christine Quinlan. I'm the Associate State Director for Colorado for the Conservation Fund. 
and um, thanks um, for to the coalition for inviting me to inviting the conservation fund and myself to be part of this today. Um, my organization, the conservation fund, implements LWCF acquisitions with all the federal agencies. And as Mark Hell pointed out, we of course really value those relationships. And this work includes a significant track record acting as the uh, lead. NGO um, on many BLM acquisition priorities. Um, and in Colorado, where I work, the BLM manages about 8 million acres, and over a million of those acres are part of the agency's system of national conservation lands. Um, we have two national monuments, three NCAs in Colorado, and a host of other national and scenic historic trails, wilderness areas, and wilderness study areas. And these are so there's quite a few opportunities here in Colorado um, for LWCF utilization. Um, um, and uh, if you would go to the next slide, please, Caleb. Um, an example that I wanted to highlight for the discussion today is our work with the BLM at Canyons of the Ancients National Monument. This is located in the Four Corners area of Southwest Colorado. It's west of the town of Cortez. And this monument created in 2000 um, under the Clinton administration contains the highest concentration of cultural sites of any place in the nation. So of course that gives it really unparalleled significance for ancestral Puebloan and other Native American cultures of the American Southwest. Um, and when this 176,000 acre monument was established, it contained uh, private inholdings uh, amidst the existing BLM land. And, and those private inholdings, many of those became priorities for BLM to try to acquire and consolidate into the monument. Um, next, next slide, please, Caleb. Uh, this map of the monument is um, unfortunately not, it's a little tough to see, it's, it's not as clear as it could be um, here, but the gray crosshatch areas are properties that have been acquired and added to the monument. The red stair-stepped property in the center of the map is an LWCF project that we're currently have in progress and hope to close in the next six to nine months and, and may, may represent um, nearing um, the end of our, our work here. Uh, a theme here at uh, Canyons of the Ancients National Monument and many, many other places is that success breeds success when it comes to LWCF. There's a domino effect where one successful project will lead to the next. And we all see that in our, in our work that we do. But here at Canyons of the Ancients, over 15 years, we've been able to add some 9,000 acres to the monument's protection. And that's been primarily through the availability of LWCF. We have had some other funding sources. Um, so here, we just tried to outline three stages in a typical BLM LWCF project. And I'm gonna suggest some ways that partners out there can, can lend support uh, to these projects at various stages and not, an, not entirely different from some of the things you heard Markel highlight in her um, example. But I also wanted to just give an understanding um, without going too in depth of the conservation funds role in these projects as, as the lead NGO. Um, because I think that by understanding our various roles, we can you know look for better ways to continue to um, partner up and um, implement more LWCF. So the first stage is the pre-LWCF application period. And I, I consider this the getting to readiness stage. This is the stage where the conservation fund or whoever the NGO is role is really most essential. And it's because we're doing things that the BLM or the federal agency is either unable to do or doesn't have the capacity to do on their own, or if they or if they can do them, they, they can't always do them as efficiently. And that's not a knock on the on the BLM or the feds. I think um, Karen Montgomery, when you hear from her her later on, she would probably be the first to tell you that that's that this assistance is essential to their agency. Um, so during this stage, the fund uh, is meeting with, well, we meet with the BLM field and state offices very regularly to help identify priority lands and assess whether there are projects that are a fit for LWCF. 
Um, a willing seller is the key to every acquisition. So we engage with landowners um, to determine their interest and to assess whether um, it's going to uh, an LWCF strategy is going to align with their value expectations and their timing. Um, again, uh, every BLM acquisition needs an appraisal done to federal standards and the conservation fund and, and other groups ability to, to initiate the appraisal is a major accelerator in the acquisition process, but it can still take, you know, six to nine months and sometimes maybe longer. And the conservation fund has the ability to secure a purchase contract with a landowner and this makes it possible to demonstrate to the LWCF appropriators that if they bring the money, the the project is deliverable. And so that's very important um, in, in terms of readiness. Um, the conservation fund can decide to use its own revolving fund to pre-acquire a property until LWCF becomes available. And we make a case-by-case -case assessment on that, but, and Canyons of the Ancients here is not the best example of that. We've, it's actually a location where we've been more successful um, not pre-acquiring properties, but in many locations, um, NGOs do buy and hold properties until LWCF uh, money uh, and the process unfolds. So ways that partners can support, you, you might be able to play a role in identifying willing sellers. You might have relationships or local knowledge that could produce a willing seller, and you can vet those with the agency or with, with a group like the Conservation Fund as those arise to see if a property would be a fit for an LWCF acquisition. Um, assistance with transaction costs is an important need. Appraisals and due diligence uh, steps are costly. So, you know, a contribution from a supporting organization of even fifty to a hundred thousand dollars, or sometimes even less than that, can be a key to kickstarting an LWCF project. And then, of course, during this time, we begin promoting the project. Um, with congressional members and other leaders and, and partners obviously can play a key role um, in elevating the priority of a project for LWCF as this sort of promotional phase gets underway. The next stage that we've highlighted is the application ranking and congressional funding process. The BLM tip, typically runs its annual LWCF application process in the second quarter. Projects originate from the local field office level and then they elevate up through the state office into the national ranking process. And um, just again, this example of Canyon of the at Canyons of the Ancients is, is one of um, a sustained LW, LWCF usage over several years. And I would just say the key ingredients were high rankings of some early projects, coupled with an, a 100% success rate of of spending those monies as we went. Um, that uh, then led to. Um, a success rate later on and making the argument for continued funding to come f to that project area. Um, and again, here partners are key to supporting the, the partner support letters and advocacy that partner groups can do are just critical at this stage. Martin, many of you probably are well aware of this whole, a lot of these aspects of this process, but March and April is typically a key time for groups to advocate with members of con Congress for their um, LWCF project funding. And at Canyons of the Ancients, we had help from a broad set of groups um, from the National Trust for Historic Preservation and the Archaeological Society to, to our state and historical preservation groups and um, our state wildlife agency and, you know, the typical cast of characters, but not the least of which were local nature associations and alliances. Um, and then the... Um, Oh, and one point I want to make as a national NGO, I, you know, we've just found it can be so, so useful to be able to collaborate with local groups because it's obvious, but they often have well-established relationships with a lot of savvy um, on the local matters that as a, as a national group, we, we lack, we don't have the presence to always form those relationships. Um, and then, you know, leveraging, leveraging LWCF through your own group's fundraising is obviously another role for supporting partners. You can perhaps close the funding gap or attract other, other sources of funding. And then the third stage is the, is the best one. It's the implementation, it's the execution. And, 
you know, I'm leaving out a lot here because there's a lot goes in goes into really getting to the goal line. But this is when all the project readiness from stage one and the due diligence and then the advocacy from stages one and two finally pay off and dovetail with the available LWCF dollars and produce a successful closing. And the role of, of partner groups is, you know, this is when if you have made some funding commitments or raised some money that would go into a project, that's when these dollars are going to need to come in and then most importantly this is the time for celebrating success and the time for um, the contributions of local partners to shine and and be acknowledged so i'll leave it at that thank you again very much for um, inviting the conservation fund to to be part of this presentation and i'll pass the um the microphone to becky bremser hello there um, my name is becky bremser and i'm of land protection for Save the Redwoods League. Um, the league's mission is to protect and restore redwood forests and connect people to them in a nutshell. We've protected over 200,000 acres and helped create 66 redwood parks and reserves. We do this work um, through the Coast Redwood Range in California, which spans from the Oregon border down to Central California. We also work in the giant sequoia range in the eastern Sierras. And the example today that I want to share is a partnership with the National Park Service. So next slide, please. Um, Redwood National and State Park is located in Northern California, where the two entities actually have a cooperative management agreement. And one of their primary visitor centers is in desperate need of replacement. It's actually located in a coastal dune area on the beach. It's subject to uh, sea level rise and flooding and tsunami risk. And because it's located on the beach, the direct access and connection to the old growth redwood forest doesn't exist. So it's the big iconic thing that brings people to visit this park. The main visitor center doesn't have that connection. So there's a big hope and dream to replace this old visitor center and build a new one just to improve the visitor experience and restore critical parklands, have a meaningful tribal connection for this area and contribute to the economic development. So let me take a step back though. So next slide and talk about this property. So in um, Redwood National Park, is a property called Oric Mill Site. It's a 125 acre formal industrial uh, timber mill site. The mill actually closed in 2009 and the population of this booming active mill town just plummeted to below 400 people. So it was just a big economic suck for this area. Um, and the project that I'm going to talk about next just would not have happened without this very small community sort of stepping up and trying to reinvent themselves. So um, go to the next slide. Um, we've sort of, Christine just went through talking about kind of that high level LWCF process. And I want to drill down with this example a little bit further about the steps it took for this project to kind of get to that readiness, that very, very first step, and really focus a little bit on how we engaged with the stakeholders there to make that happen. So this slide sort of shows the steps in that very, very first, first phase to get to readiness. So of course, this property became available from this industrial timber seller because the mill closed. So the league, very similar to um, the conservation fund, is able to sort of step up, bring in our expertise, our acquisition expertise and negotiation skills to sort of secure that property as we start through this long process. We also have worked and collaborated, collaborated with the National Park Service at Redwood National Park for years. We've been working there together. We have that established relationship. But it was really focusing, and this is the part I want to emphasize, is just how we engage with stakeholders there. So we knew that in order to get support for this, to just make this project go through the ranks, we were really going to need to focus on that Humboldt County supervisor support. When mills close, it's, it's devastating. It's a big hit to the, to the county. So getting their support to rethink and reimagine that for us actually started with that local ORIC community. So it was going in there really before we even launched with the idea of a visitor center of understanding what their need was. And the primary need that quickly got articulated was 
you know, how do we move economic development from this timber uh, fishing economy and move it toward this tourism economy, which was the direction they wanted to move. Um, they realized that building, you know, having this mill site, in the center of their community converted into a visitor center would bring economic benefits from the construction of the visitor center. And then obviously once it's built, there's an estimated of 800,000 people that would be going through this visitor center per year. So the support um, and see of these visitors that are gonna seek that amenity out. And as soon as the little, little community of Oreck realized that and advocated and got behind that, the Humboldt County supervisors really spl flipped and started joining in and promoting this. All of that work took two to three years. I also want to highlight another really important supporter here was the Yurok tribe. They were a very core partner from the inception of idea of this project. We met with them, the Save the Redwoods League met with the Yurok Tribal Council and Culture Committee very early on to re and received critical input and collaboration at the start. So all of that had to take place before we even applied. But then it was wonderful because we had this core foundation that we could go to time and time again as the project prepared the application preparation through the um, continued advocacy and ranking and funding all the, all the steps forward, we could continue go, to go to this base and ask for that support, send the emails, make the calls, just critical through that whole phase. But just getting to that project readiness, that very first step, getting that core group together was really important. So where we are now with the project is Save the Redwoods League has acquired the property Redwoods National Park has received LWCF funding. We're currently working through visitor, um, visitor center design plans. And last summer we kicked off some of the key restoration of the property and um, site prep for the visitor center. So I will pass this over now to Alan Front. Greetings, am I live? <laughs> okay. And Becky nodded yes, so I guess I'm on. Um, thank you, Becky, for that. And, and Becky and Christine and Markel, thank you all for providing some real useful on the ground, real world uh, examples of, of the way these projects can work. And in those discussions, all of you heard some, some, uh, some ingredients, some markers for success that I think we'll all benefit from, but we may talk about a little bit more as this uh, webinar continues. Uh, by way of self-introduction, I'm Alan Front, and I've been working on LWCF uh, programmatically and on projects since the early 1980s when a dozen eggs cost 50 cents. The captain was still singing with Tennille and uh, 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 House Natural Resources National Park Subcommittee Chairman Joe Neguse was six years old. Uh, that makes me a doddering senior citizen in the LWCF community, and I will provide a little bit of grandfatherly uh, perspective, but more importantly, I'm here to bring you the perspectives of three federal agency folks who really uh, have managed and continue to manage these, the, the LWCF program in, in remarkable ways. Leslie talked about Great American Outdoors Act as a game changer, and I'd suggest that the three people you're about to hear from are really all stars in that game who are suited up and, and the, the people that you just want to have on the field. Um, the first perspective that you'll hear is, uh, is that of Pam McClay, whom I met uh, when she was a Fish and Wildlife Service appraiser in the 1980s or early 90s maybe. Since then she has, uh, well, she currently serves as the acting chief of land resources for the National Park Service. But she has play, played a number of roles in appraisal, in facilities and contracting, and in land resources, including land acquisition, that give her just a remarkable and valuable set of experiences and, 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 and calibrations of the way these programs work and of their importance to the agency. So you'll hear from her. You'll also hear from Eric Alvarez, uh, who also goes back decades uh, in his work in realty and also has abundant experience working not only um, on land and water projects and other land adjustments, serving as secretary to the Migratory Bird Conservation Commission and 
helping to steer and guide the process for the expenditure of those funds. But it also has, uh, has, uh, has uh, worked and run the international program at the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, has deep experience in the appraisal world as well. And then third, you'll hear from Karen Montgomery at the BLM and each of our uh, real world example project uh, partners that you just heard from uh, spoke about a project with one and the next one of these three agencies and uh, Christine's discussion, uh, she specifically mentioned Karen. We all recognize that Karen, who likewise has worn many hats and has been with the BLM for better than 30 years, um, is ably running the the, uh, the BLM land adjustment program through LWCF as well as it's ever been run. And so um, I'm going to turn it over first to Pam and then maybe just ask the three of you to go in order, uh, turning it over to each other before we then uh, go to some uh, roundtable discussion and questions. Pam? Great. Well, thanks, Alan. Thank you for that warm welcome. Um, I appreciate being offered the opportunity to talk to you all today. Um, this is my second week on the job, so um, it's been an exciting 10 days. Uh, today, I'm gonna give you a brief presentation, talk a little bit about the mission of the Park Service and the roles that the land office plays with that. Um, what's on the horizon for FY22? Um, NPS's future unmet needs. What does full funding mean to NPS? Um, kind of the status of our FY23 budget formulation. And lastly, some areas that we're looking to um, strategize on expediting land acquisition efforts. Next slide, please. So the National Park Service mission is to preserve unimpaired natural and cultural resource values for the enjoyment, education, and inspiration of future generations. The LANDS program contributes to this mission through acquiring physical resources within the authorized boundary of the Park Service system. Next slide, please. So what's on the horizon for FY22? Um, we have the FY22 presidential budget, that request was $53.7 million. Um, it also uh, takes into account the sequestration of 5.7%. Um, there were fully funding 33 line items for that um, presidential budget. And the projects uh, include about 131,000 acres. Um, we have received a recent house markup. And as of today, we are still waiting for the Senate markup. Next slide, please. So um, our future unmet needs uh, would be our backlog, obviously. Uh, right now, as of today, the NPS backlog is about 1.8 million acres of private inholdings identified for protection with an estimated $2 billion of uh, overall costs. Obviously our backlog um, changes on a daily basis. We have boundary expansions, we have acquisitions, and uh, we add new units. So that number is in flux and uh, we're continually working very hard to try to uh, preserve and protect those much needed assets for the park. Next slide, please. So what does full funding mean to the park service? It means now we have a robust uh, budget for acquisition. Uh, we have funds available to um, staff up so that we can um, acquire those much needed backlotted properties. Um, LWCF is not limitless though. I mean, as I said, we are gonna to continue to have backlog. Um, our land acquisition hasn't, hasn't changed just because we have more funding. Um, and we are always going to need the support and help of our partners like you here on the call today. Next slide, please. So where we are in FY23, we're at budget formulation. Um, we've received and ranked uh, the FY23 requests that have come to us through the parks and regions and the request uh, list right now is uh, sitting with the administration um, and uh, we uh, anticipate moving forward with that request. And next slide, please. So while I'm here for the next 120 days, there's been some efforts and initiatives uh, that I've been asked to take a look at. Um, and to work with you all as well as our staff. Um, as you know, the land acquisition process for the Park Service 
can take, and for any federal agency, can take quite a bit of time. It's, it's generally a three to five year process. So areas that we're going to be looking at is how we can improve our appraisal process. Um, we've had meetings with AVSO on maybe developing some in-house capacity. Should we look at some waiver opportunities? Um, we also want to take a look at how we might address costs and acreage sailings. Um, we're looking at uh, contracting efficiencies. And um, I'm not sure, but there's been a paper developed um, as part of the Great American Outdoors Initiative that really outlines some of these strategies. If you haven't had an opportunity to take a look at that, please do so. And again, if there's any questions, um, we're here to answer. I would be remiss not to mention that Howard Miller and uh, Miriam uh, are on the phone today as well. Both of them act as deputies for the program. And um, we're looking forward to working with you. And I will pass this off to Eric. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, I'm actually going to build on some of the stuff that Pam has said because she covered um, what we all in Interior operate under. Uh, all those items that she mentioned are in process. Uh, we're doing in the Fish and Wildlife Service too. So um, I just wanted to go and ahead and tell you a little bit about how the service operates and, and we're a little bit different than a multi-use agency like the BLM or the Forest Service and a specific use agency like the Park Service because we're about fish and wildlife conservation. So let's go to the next slide, please. So as you can see, uh, uh, we have an organic mission and it's to administer a network of lands across the United States, specifically for fish, wildlife and plant resources and habitats but at the same time providing in our legislative mandate six priority uses for public. And that includes hunting, fishing, recreation, um, uh, interpretation and education. So we cover all those things at the same time as we protect our plant and fish and wildlife resources. We have 567 national wildlife refuges currently and also 38 management wet, wetland management districts in the upper Midwest uh, uh, located in the prairie pothole portion of the United States as well as seven national monuments. Uh, a couple of those, actually three of those are out in the, in the ocean and altogether Fish and Wildlife Service oversees 855 million acres. Um, before anybody kind of gets um, kind of uh, worried, the map that you have here is an older map that shows our regional boundaries. Uh, back in the last administration, we went to a consolidated department-wide boundaries that look different from this. However, all of our refuges are still currently managed according to these lines on the, on the map. Let's go to the next slide, please. So the Fish and Wildlife Service is, I think, I believe the only agency that can actually grow itself. We do not need legislative direction to create a new refuge or expand the refuge. However, we do have a number of those that are done legislatively. Uh, the biggest way that we expand the National Wildlife Refuge system is administratively going through a decision document process in the NEPA. Uh, before 1976, the president and the secretary could create uh, new refuges or expand them, but that has since gone away. And we do most of our expansions through uh, in internal Fish and Wildlife Service administrative actions. Next slide, please. So we have a number of types of boundaries within the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, this one is Patoka River in Indiana, and it is what we call the static boundary. When the planning is done, it is to include potentially the acquisition of all the lands within that boundary uh, that are still suitable for acquisition. Obviously, as time moves on, if something is developed and is no longer uh, suitable for fish or wildlife habitat, we would not go ahead and acquire that. But our planning goals is to acquire all the acreage within that boundary from Will and Sellers. Next slide, please. Another type of boundary, and this is in the working landscapes process. Um, this is the Blackfoot Valley Conservation Area in Montana. And it is a you know, couple million acres in the, within that boundary, but our goal is not to acquire every acre. Our goal is to acquire a subset of those through conservation easements, where we can maintain the working ranches uh, on the landscape and facilitate at the same time uh, fish and wildlife habitat conservation. Um, next slide, please. And then this last example is the Silvio Conti Refuge. Um, so 
it's a, a unique type of a refuge creation for us because it's watershed based. The big boundary around the outside is the entire Connecticut River watershed. And then what we've done is identified areas within that watershed that are critical for conservation, and not just critical for the Fish and Wildlife Service, but for our partners at the state, local, and private levels. And that's where, as you heard Markel talk about the, the, the refuge, we work with those partners to make sure that everybody has one little piece along that area, and we leverage funding depending on where the best needs are. Next slide. So how do we grow ourselves? Um, in 1997, Congress told us that we need to have a strategic growth policy and a, a systematic way of identifying what it is that we need to focus on. Because prior to that, you know, we've been around since two, uh, 1903, officially, and we've done a pretty good job con conserving fish and wildlife resources in the United States. However, systematically, as resources become more scarce, we need to focus on the best of the best. So we had, we had groups work together to develop basically three targets, uh, the recovery of endangered and threatened species where uh, fish and wildlife service acquisitions are important, the implementation of the North American Waterfowl Management Plan, which is a pretty comprehensive plan for waterfowl throughout the United States, and then conserving migratory birds of conservation concern. As you all know, we, we've lost uh, 4 billion birds here over the last few decades. And what do we need to do to make sure that these uh, migratory birds are still, still around in, in decades to come? So these three areas, we develop a tracking, um, a, the track system, which is a prioritization and analysis system to showcase the biological importance of every refuge that is submitted where they have willing sellers. And the next slide, please. So this is just a sample of the targeted resource acquisition comparison tool that we rank each and every refuge that comes in annually through our budget request process. And this is just a sample decision matrix for uh, the shorebird ranking, which is a subset of the migratory birds of conservation concern. So we start basically kind of on the left-hand side and proceed all the way to the right and projects are arrayed according to their biological importance. And all this information is available on our website if there's any additional interest. So let's go to the next slide. And as Alan mentioned, uh, one of my other hats, I'm the Secretary to the Migratory Bird Conservation Fund which historically in the last few years have been, has been the largest funding source for land acquisition for us. As you can see, this is a 2020 uh, budget that we operated under and LWCF was about 31 million and a half and migratory birds was 85.3. Now with the full funding of LWCF, that has more, you know, half and half uh, in, in, according to our budget. And then knock on North American Wetlands Conservation Act grants uh, is not an insignificant amount of money, but it also contributes. And the key thing with NACA, it tends to be matched one to, at least one-to-one -one by private sources. Next slide, please. Just to recap, um, you know, we within the Fish and Wildlife Service still have a, more than 8 million acres just outside of Alaska remaining to be acquired within our previously identified boundaries. So, um, we continue to chip at it and any additional funding that is provided to the Fish and Wildlife Service goes towards uh, acquisitions at those refuges. And as Pam mentioned, there's always the opportunity to create new refuges or expand boundaries. And why do we even create new ones or expand them is as a reaction to biological conservation needs. If an endangered species is listed that requires federal conservation efforts, that is something that we certainly would step towards and start doing planning. Also looking at the landscape uh, under this, the current administration, we're finally able to talk about climate change and climate impacts. Within the Fish and Wildlife Service, we're looking at the connectivity needs of a number of species where we already have management responsibilities. So we're taking some of the work that, uh, big shout out to the Nature Conservancy who's done some great climate modeling as well as uh, Audubon, um, who's done some great uh, processes. And we're always looking for additional information where our private sector partners were able to develop while the federal side was kind of 
not allowed to even talk about climate change. So I'm looking forward to having more science for us to be able to strategically grow the fish and wildlife service. And with that, I uh, thank you so much for your time. Look forward to chatting during the round table and I will turn it over to my colleague, Karen Montgomery. Thanks, Eric. Um, I, on the other hand, do not have any slides. So I will keep it brief and we will get onto some questions here shortly, but I did have a couple of things I just wanted to share with all of you. Um, honestly, I think BLM is poised to make a huge difference in the landscape with Land and Water Conservation Fund um, and the Great American Outdoors Act. Um, the prior to Great American Outdoors Act, uh, BLM typically would receive about $20 million capped projects at $5 million uh, so that we could spread the money a little thinner. Uh, but with Great American Outdoors Act, the cap has been removed. We're able to acquire larger project areas, make a bigger impact, and uh, also more inholdings. Our budget now is over $60 million. Um, we'd like to see that continue um, on an upward trend. We just uh, called for our 2023 projects. They uh, will be being reviewed here shortly, um, but the need out there for 2023 is about 200 million. So we have plenty on the books. The thing that's nice about BLM is it's a, it's a nice blend between park service and fish and wildlife service because we have boundaries and we don't have boundaries. Um, we can build the bridges between the islands um, we uh, expand our wilderness through section six. We um, are able to do a lot of the things that the other agencies aren't able to do, which makes us truly unique. Also in the fact that our, we have that multiple use mandate. Um, because we don't have, we have multiple use mandate, we are always um, modifying our criteria for which we, rank our proposals based on administration's priorities. So things like the new America the Beautiful um, initiative is uh, driving our, our criteria. So our criteria uh, for this, this current round is uh, things that conserve and protect our resources, uh, can add to the climate change problem, which we try to solve that. Uh, communities at risk and tribal interests. And then there's also a big emphasis put upon partnerships and having those strong partnerships. Uh, project readiness is a new category for us. We, we want to try to move forward those that are the most ready. So I know I've heard from our partners talking a lot about project readiness, and that's what we're looking for uh, in the last appropriations from Congress. BLM was um, a little scolded in that we were said we, we didn't process transactions fast enough. So we need to get things that are ready to go. Um, we also have our recreational access, which is almost equal with our, our, our core funding now. Um, and so we have some specific criteria just to recreational access that deal with the quantity and quality and also the Dingle Act needs for public access. Um, what are some of our unmet needs? Well, staffing, 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 and more staffing. Um, we are trying to uh, get some, some, uh, some staff issues resolved. It's going to take some time. Uh, we also know we have staffing issues at ABSO. Um, I've been talking with them about how we can work together on some things as well. But staffing is probably the biggest one. BLM has also been working on a um, mapping application. We'll have probably later this summer uh, where on our website, we're gonna identify all of the past acquisitions that have been LWC funded um, through a mapping um, tool. So that's coming. Let's see um, some of our streamlining measures that I have on my radar is um, BLM is one of the few agencies who does not have a categorical exclusion from NEPA for our land acquisition. Uh, so my, uh, I'd like to see if we can't get the use of the Fish and Wildlife Services categorical exclusion 
to uh, facilitate streamlining some of our processes. Also, our regulations for land acquisitions were removed from the CFR um, in the mid 90s. And I think we need to put something back in there. It may not be long, but I think we need to put our regs back in. Um, and then just how we're organized and how we uh, operate, I think uh, as a whole uh, needs to be reevaluated. I think, you know, as far as the partners go, you need to continue to work with your field offices, state offices. They, they are your eyes and ears on the ground. Uh, the organization that I'm talking about is internal to how we, how we move forward with our, our project proposals. So. Um, with that, I think we'll go to questions and I'll turn it back over to Alan, I suppose. Done. Thank you, Karen. And thanks to all three of you. I think what's clear in just those brief discussions is both the, 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 the capable management of these programs and the opportunity but also the complexities involved, especially Karen, as you talk about some of these technical issues. And sadly, I know that we have about half an hour left, which may be just short of the time that we need to wrestle out every complexity in this in these programs. But um, what I'm hoping that we can do for just a couple of minutes before we turn to your questions, and I do invite all of you to add questions to the Q and A box so that we can have a full roster of your uh, responses and concerns and, and, and interests. But before we get there, there are a couple of uh, maybe two or three quick broad themes that I'd like to ask our panelists to, to comment on. And one of them involves something that Pam, you said about how before Great American Outdoors Act, there was acquisition and a backlog. And now that we have Great American Outdoors Act, there's acquisition and a backlog. And so I wonder if maybe quickly any or all of our agency and uh, NGO panelists can comment on what the, how, how empowering the full funding of LWCF is and, and also how limiting it is, what it doesn't do as well as what it does for the big programs that you've talked about and the big conservation initiatives regionally that, that the uh, NGO partners talked about. How much does this get done and, and, and how, how bad does the backlog remain? Eric, do you oh. want to go first? Sure. I mean, I, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, you know, since it is willing seller based, and uh, I don't like to call it a backlog, I call it an opportunity. So within the Fish and Wildlife Service, we have 800, 8 million acres of opportunity at any one time. And um, annually, and I'll just share with you guys, we receive requests for rankings in the $300 million. So even though full funding has grown significantly for all of the bureaus, for us, it's, it's a matter of magnitude that potentially in order to annually meet the needs of those willing sellers, um, we're gonna need more resources. Um, and when I say resources, it's not just on the dollar side for acquisition, but associated with that are resources to increase the appraisal capacity because there are two bottleneck points for all the bureaus uh, within the, the Department of Interior, and that is we re rely on the solicitor's office for title work, and we rely on the appraisal group for the valuation piece. Uh, I have, we've had some conversations with the solicitor's office about figuring out ways to streamline their title delivery and title review. So I'm looking forward to that. So overall, um, we have a lot of work to meet to do and could use a lot more support. Yeah, with BLM is the same. Um, I think the one thing that uh, we rely on a ton is our partners to help us with the transactions. We can't do it without them. We just don't have enough staff or people or time or contractors or any of it. So the, the reliance on our contract, uh, I mean, our partners is, is invaluable. Yeah, and, and I would add, Alan, you're, you're right. I mean, LWCF is, uh, you know, full funding is, is terrific and it's really given us a sense of permanency. Mm -hmm. But what it hasn't done is change our acquisition process and our due diligence obligations and the timelines that come with that. And three to five years 
uh, for average acquisition time is super long. So without the support of our partners, you know, we would lose those opportunities uh, on a pretty regular basis. So, you know, that's why we've created some streamlining efforts and we actually are working with uh, Eric and Karen on the AVSO, um, you know, how to streamline the appraisal process. Um, I think we're gonna get some resources to address title. Um, and then for us, hiring is also a critical path forward. And we are looking at ways to expedite our hiring process. Miriam and Wendy, who's retiring, you may know Wendy, they've been working very, very diligently on hiring in the regions, uh, Washington level, and looking at sort of, you know, what, of our, what is our quickest pathway forward, bringing on more capacity. Yeah, and the thing with the hiring is that it really takes a specialized skill. And, you know, we keep stealing from each other and we've got to, we've got to stop doing that and bring some new people on. <laughs> Great. And I was going to raise staffing, but since you've at least touched on it, um, I'm going to check that box. And thanks for those perspectives. I also want to raise at least one more question, but first just want to comment there as we talk about, I'm now corrected, Eric, not the backlog, but the, uh, the abundant opportunity. At the outset of this, I think it was Leslie who talked about the $900 million plus or minus of Great American Outdoors Act being a floor and not a ceiling. And what that act does is to guarantee that the inflow of money each year to the LWCF is, is available to be spent in that next year, which is great. What it also did, which may be equally great, is left in place Congress's ability to provide more money under the old system, under the old appropriated system. And so there's this dedicated funding that really can take care of a tremendous amount. It basically doubles the amount of conservation money that's available through LWCF. But as Eric talks about a, a 30 some odd million dollar uh, budget in fiscal 20 for LWCF, and a $300 million need. I'm not good at math, but that seems 10X to me. And if we need to have additional resources for projects and programs that not just folks on the screen, but the couple hundred people who are uh, getting sharing the benefit of, of your comments today, um, there is ample opportunity to impact the process to bring more dollars to the, to the table. And so that's something that maybe we can talk about a bit more in Q&A. Other thing I just want to ask about uh, of, of our panelists before we go to, to, to questions is, is has been raised by a few people uh, off the screen and in the in the uh, in the the Q and A box and that has to do with some of the the, uh, the the less project identified items in your in your budgets, um, Karen and and Pam and, and Eric. Um, what we all know is that. 18 months, two years before the money shows up, you've got to be doing reckoning as to what projects are going to be your, your top line needs. And we also know that in real estate and in conservation, a lot can change in 18 months or two years. And so one of the programs that you've got some more flexibility with and a number of people expressed interest in is the acquisition, uh, is, I'm sorry, the, uh, the recreation access line item, which in each of your budgets gets now 10, 12, 15, 18, 20 million dollars a year. Can, can the three of you talk a bit about uh, how you use those funds and what your process is, especially in the event that there are projects coming online that may not have been thought about two years before the, uh, the, the, the need for money is, is there? Yeah, the Bureau of Land Management, um, I think receives more Rec access money than the other agencies, which we are very, very thankful for. We had 20 million this last round. Um, we actually uh, used to have all of our proposals come in together and then the review team would then decide which ones were gonna be rec access and which ones weren't. Uh, based a lot on the project readiness because it's that year funding, right? It's not, it doesn't have to wait through the budget cycle. Um, we've switched that up this year where we're asking the states to tell us uh, which ones are rec access um, and gave them some criteria by which to measure their projects uh, so that we can um, move on those quickly. But I think preparedness of the project 
is probably the critical item on all of those um, is that they're ready to go because the funds are, are available much sooner than the um, regular budget cycle pro projects. Great. So um, I'm going to contradict my colleague Karen a little bit um, because you know while the REC access line has been a great one for us, we do, um, as a lot of folks may know, a lot of hunting and fishing on refuges uh, during the, la the last administration. That was basically the only focus for the REC access line. However, currently we're looking at expanding those to any public recreational use that we have a responsibility for. The one challenge that we have with the REC access line is even though Congress appropriates it as a lump sum, we still have to identify projects under that line and then go back to Congress for approval. Um, the last cycle for 2020, uh, actually the 2019, 2020 for the Fish and Wildlife Service, it took us almost an entire year just to get it out of the department. It does almost two. <laughs> two years. <laughs> so, so yeah, so it's not, that adds uh, a certain level of timing that we, I would love to be able to, as Karen mentioned, be just in time where a project comes in ready to go for funding. We can allocate the funds almost immediately. Yeah, I agree. Those are the projects we put on the list and then we still wait. So yeah, it's kind of uh, a little bit frustrating because we didn't get our 2020 list approved till new administration came in. So yeah, that was a long time. Uh, and our 2021 list is um, still waiting to go to Congress. So, you know, in the meantime, I've had projects fall off the list and, you know, it's, it's frustrating. Yeah, and maybe the one thing I, I'd offer before we then turn to questions, and I'm gonna kick this over to Amy Lindholm to handle the, uh, the, 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 the copious input in the question box. But um, the, the one thing I'd suggest is that as we talk about these different parts of LWCF and how the money flows, how projects are prioritized, how uh, 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 funding appears, how it gets expended, what the staff needs are to get it out the door. Um, it, it is a wonderfully complex and often labyrinthic process. And so for folks who are participating in this today and who have at least gotten a taste of what it takes to get these projects done, uh, the, the land resources, realty staffs of these of the agencies have a capacity to help provide something of a skeleton key to the complexity of, of, uh, of these needs. And so I, I, our NGO partners, each of them talked about their uh, close work with the agencies. And what I'd suggest is that nothing's impossible and everything is complicated. And the only way that you can uh, get past the same possibility and and toward the the, uh, the the reality of a project is to commune with agency folks about roles, responsibilities, how to tie things down, what it takes for projects to land on a priority list, what it takes to get them processed through the completion. So with that, uh, and with many thanks to everybody across the top of my screen, uh, Amy, maybe you'd like to take us through some of the questions that have landed in the uh, in the question box. Yes, I would love to. Thank you all for your presentations, and thank you to everyone who is sticking with us in the audience um, past the hour mark. Uh, it's really great to see so many people actively engaged. Um, <clears throat> we have some good questions that have been posed in the question box, um, and so I'm going to try to get through as many as possible here. Um, there's an interesting one about tribes that I was hoping folks could answer. Um, one partner says, I recently discovered Fish and Wildlife Service has a policy um, prohibiting doing easements with tribes. Do NPS and BLM have similar policies? How would the panelists suggest federal agencies and tribes partner on land conservation? Because I know we have a lot of interest in partnering with tribes. Um, so would love to hear what folks have to say about that. I'm not sure I quite understand the question, um, but maybe Eric can help us with that because I, I can't envision how this would work. So, Amy, that's kind of interesting because I am not aware that we have such a policy. And if we do, we're not following it because we've done a number of easements. Um, 
primarily with Native Alaskan tribes, a, a lot you know, across their landscape. And we work with partners that, that are interested where conservation uh, you know, can be accomplished cooperatively. Perhaps uh, maybe Alaska is unique because of ANILCA and, and its uh, specific laws, but I'm not aware that we have a hard, fast, we're not gonna work with a tribe rule. Okay, I think there's a lot of interest in exploring the flexibilities that are um, that are available the, uh, for working with tribes. So, um, if you have any suggestions as to how to guide people, um, Amy, can, can I just make a, that. go ahead, please make a comment about Park Service? Pam, I think already mentioned it, but Park Service is limited to acquiring land within national park boundaries. So love to work with tribes. Maybe in the future, there could be management agreements of some kind, especially if there's adjacent lands to national parks, that would be intriguing. And I'd love, and maybe superintendents have already started looking into that or already have some, I don't know. So we have, you know, park service is pretty limited in what its acquisition is. And the other thing, for better or for worse, park service doesn't acquire a lot of conservation easements. Sometimes, you know, we have scenic easements on trail, you know, for trails a lot, but Otherwise, the limitations to the park services, who they're acquiring from. I think working with the tribes, I think, would be better and better. And one thing I will mention, I was on a, it was a few months ago, but it was really a wonderful presentation from Cultural Resources about how much they're engaging tribes to do interpretation themselves in national parks. So they're getting tribal members to do that, which has been fantastic and long overdue. So I would encourage that as maybe a start for reaching out to tribes and getting them engaged that way. And Miriam, I, thanks for that. And thanks for everything yeah. that you do. I, I, I do want to note, I, I, it was maybe 15 years ago or so, I, I worked on a successful 17,000 acre, $32 million easement with a tribe that the Fish and Wildlife Service acquired. So I, I think there is a path forward, but I do know that with tribes, there may be some complexities having to do with the, the, the the tenure of land and whether or not they're trust lands or whether or not they are uh, tribally owned or whether they're owned by individual tribal members. And so, again, I think these are the sorts of, 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 of bore down questions that um, there are good answers to that relate to the specifics of whatever you're get, trying to get done, but you should definitely commune with the, your agency partners about how to deal with the, the, those sorts of panel wheels. Yeah, I'd agree, Alan. I, with BLM, I don't know of a prohibition. It would really mo more uh, revolve around their the status of whether it's a trust lands or not. Yeah, in the park service, we we usually have a cooperative agreements with the with the tribe. We don't actually go out and acquire the lands from the tribe. I think the charcoal culture was one that we've had an agreement with the tribes for many years, and we work together as partners. We don't. Uh, I think we also we have. Uh, Tribal lands that bad lands, which we try to it's managed on under an agreement with, with the tribes. We don't actually go out and do any acquisition of the tribal lands in most cases. Secondly, unless they're in our boundary, right? I mean, they'd have to be. In oh our yeah, the unless the boundary, right? Yeah, and cooperative management agreements are a great tool. Mm -hmm. Here's another interesting question. Um, we talk a lot about the importance of local support and the, the importance of congressional support. But if the local congressperson is not supportive of a project, is that a death knell for an agency moving the project forward up the bureaucratic chain of approval for submissions in the budget request? Or how would folks, um, what would folks suggest um, partners do in, in a situation like that? I mean, and for, for us at the Park Service, it's obviously one factor we look at when submissions come in for requests for priority, uh, but it's certainly not the only one. We would move it forward and the local congressman, of course, could always take it out after he gets to Congress. That, that has happened previously, but uh, as Pam says, it's, it's one of the criteria we use when we submit a request to Congress, do we have local support? Yeah, you know, one, one thing I'd offer, and I know there are a bunch more questions, so, but one thing I'd offer is that in Howard and, 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 and Pam and, and, and Becky and, 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 uh, and Markel, 
all of you are quite experienced in putting together projects where you get the sort of unanimity of support that's needed to drive it forward. And it, it, certainly what uh, uh, one member or another of Congress might feel about a project's important, but maybe what's most important is sort of mapping out that, that, uh, that consensus. Because um, when you do a project, you first, of course, need a willing seller. That's a part of the partnership. Otherwise, it becomes a lot more difficult. But beyond the willing seller and maybe a third party who is able to help you secure real estate, um, you've also got to have um, uh, community support. And it, that runs from local officials to uh, community groups and, and, uh, and, and private sector leaders and NGO community you've got to have a, a, a case that actually sort of measures up, not just for a particular me member of Congress, but that makes sense for congressional decision makers that are choosing among projects. And so again, I would just flag, this as one of those things where it's really useful to, 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 to work with between uh, the private and public sector to come up with a plan of action that actually keeps anybody from uh, slashing the tires. And, and but, but I also make a suggestion. Yeah. Um, we tend to forget, especially if it's prior to one of our partners acquiring the land, the private landowner is a constituent of these representatives. Mm -hmm. And I would actually say that it may be helpful to think about and plant in the back of your mind, not only in these situations where maybe there's a, a congressional representative who's not supportive. One, obviously get that constituent to reach out to their staffers and explain how they wanna sell their land um, you know, to the federal government and that they're a willing seller. And so they speak one-on-one -on -one with them or try to reach to their staffers. But I would actually encourage that um, going forward. I mean, some of, some of the things that we've all raised in the uh, agencies, these, uh, um, obstacles and these uh, delays with our appraisals and with other things, acquired, getting money, other, other things that become, that it, uh, attenuate our acquisition process. It may help to get the constituents, the landowners themselves to speak to the, to the representatives, because I think if they hear it more than once, that gosh, that agency is taking two years to get an appraisal on my property. I'm going somewhere else to sell my property. I wanted to sell it to the Park Service. That may help make Congress more aware of some of the things that are uh, impeding our, our ability to acquire land more uh, readily. And, and also with the Park Service, our acquisitions have to be congressionally authorized. The park or the unit has to be congressionally authorized. And it was, if there is local opposition to the park, most likely, the local congressman won't support the, act or the authorization, so it never gets authorized. So that it goes through that filter before it's uh, it goes to Congress uh, before we get the authorization. So great, thank you, Howard and and Amy. I'm going to jump in just because. So, Ellen, uh, just one of the things yeah, that uh, I can't stress enough is work with the bureaus, and we in the Fish and Wildlife Service are working on about a five-year list. We're working way out into the future because our resources are finite and we have to ensure that we can react in a just-in-time acquisition approach and basically get things perfectly aligned between the, the title, the pre-acquisition work, and the, the appraisal, as well as the funding. So it all comes together at the right time. And, and that way, also, if, if biologically, it's not a high priority for the Fish and Wildlife Service, but it's important to a community, we can start having those dialogues and, and um, never doesn't necessarily mean never, but we can collectively uh, communicate those needs and, and figure out strategic ways of meeting both sides' uh, interests. Great, thanks. And, and I'm, I'm gonna jump in just because I'm seeing some stuff. I'm realizing that as our clock ticks down uh, on this and, and uh, we still have a number of people who are here. There are a couple of items that are maybe of broad interest to the to, to folks who are participating that maybe we can get to and get a bit of perspective from our NGO partners as well as our, our uh, public agency partners. One of them, there's a question that I think leads to a, 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 some perspective that would be great to hear from you all. I'll answer the simple question, which is whether NGOs can apply directly for LWCF dollars. And the, I think the simple answer is that uh, uh, LWCF dollars go to 
public agencies who are going to be the long term managers. That's the case, whether it's state and local assistance or whether it's federal projects. But it does sort of beg the question as to what the best connection is between NGOs and a, a lot of the folks who are on the on this webinar are NGO partners. Um, what's the what's the best connection? Uh, how what do you rely? It's been talked about a little bit in this in this in your presentations, but um, uh, NGO folks and and uh, agency folks, how do you work together from the front end to the back end to, to get projects done? What are the what's the right uh, distribution of responsibilities? Mm. My well, every project is different. Um, so it's really, it comes down to what the capacity is in that office, how many people they have, how, what their experience level is. So it really varies from a lot of interaction to maybe no interaction. So it, it, it is, we don't have very many projects that have no interaction anymore with a partner, um, but it really does vary widely. I mean, Alan, I think a couple of us touched on it, but obviously our partners are very helpful when it comes to due diligence, you know, prior to us getting funding, getting title reports, you know, getting estimates of value, maybe not full yellow book, um, looking at environmental issues. So yeah, and, and being the conduit with the landowner and working closely with them to explain our process and our timelines, um, that, that quite often is a huge benefit to us to be able to explain, you know, especially in a marketplace right now where people expect things to be on the market and the next day sold. Um, it makes it really, really challenging for us as agencies and you all really help with that effort and that communication. So um, we couldn't do it without you. We appreciate it. Right, and, and just to what Pam's saying, they help with all the due diligence, but also the obvious thing is they bridge a lot of these transactions. So we are incredibly grateful too because Sometimes the landowner, there are a lot of reasons. Oftentimes we're working with heirs to the original landowner. So people are impatient to get their, you know, their, their inheritance. So there's all sorts of situations. I'm using that as one example, but oftentimes our partners have been willing to acquire these lands and hold them until we can get this money teed up. As everyone keeps saying, we're two years out, we're five years out. Obviously we don't want any of our partners to have to hold property for five years, but we have numerous, numerous examples at the park service where we are acquiring from the nonprofit because they stepped in and acquired that land for us. Yeah, we actually have a question about that. Um, I think some of our project expert panelists mentioned uh, the concept of a revolving fund or, or um, groups being able to acquire land and hold it. Um, maybe you could say a little bit more about that, um, Christine or um, Becky. Is it possible for a land trust to acquire lands and submit like for reimbursement? How does that work? Um, and also the concept of, you know, a good fit lands for LWCF uh, funding has come up. So what qualities do you think make a good fit? Can, can I actually say something about, don't, don't try to guess. I mean, work with the Park Service or Fish and Wildlife or BLM, don't go out and acquire land and then see if it's gonna be a fit. Cause then you could, yeah. you know, these nonprofits could be stuck holding that property, work hand in hand early with the agencies to identify the priorities of the agencies, not try to back it in. In terms of reimbursement, again, it's this, it's, you know, certainly there's reimbursement for due diligence and things like that, but don't go out and acquire land and say, hey, we'd like to get reimbursed. It's working with the partner so that eventually the agency can acquire that property from them and they'll, and the, you know, the nonprofit will get the, the acquisition money plus oftentimes they can get reimbursed for a lot of the due diligence costs, but really try not to back into what our priorities are or what our criteria is for when we request land and water conservation fund, because I don't want to see any nonprofit get stuck holding a property for a long time. Well, and that's where the double-edged sword comes is we're only going to pay market value based on an AVSO appraisal. Uh, so when the profit purchases that property and holds that property, it's really uh, dependent upon what happens in the market during that intervening period. And uh, we've had uh, NGOs end up with parcels for uh, holding them for a very long time because we can't uh, you know, meet the value of what was paid originally. Uh, 
Um, and then the opposite also happens. So it's, it goes both ways. And Amy, I can um, jump in and answer the specific question. When the conservation fund deploys its revolving fund, those are for properties that our organization buys and holds. We do also have a land conservation loan program um, where we can um, provide funding for partner groups, you know, other kinds of land trusts, where the takeout, you know, the eventual takeout and payback of our loan may be LWCF funding. And in those cases, in both of those instances, whichever circumstance we're moving, whichever direct or direction we're doing, the conservation fund's vast experience with LWCF, I think generally, um, generally avoids us getting stuck holding the bag as Miriam and, and Karen have mentioned um, and, and trying to guess what criteria might fit. Um, we stay very closely aligned. And, and you know, it does, does all start with typically, it depends on the agency, but staying very close with the local uh, and regional realty staff and working um, on what, for the conservation fund, one of our hallmarks is that we work on other, other partners' priorities. So we're not showing up at the agency and saying, this should be your priority. We, it, we're we're there to implement what the agency is telling us. These are our priorities. These are likely to be our high priorities. These are areas we really want to focus on. We may bring something forward and say, yeah, but are you looking at this um, based on what we're hearing? But that's one way. And and then, yeah, I would just emphasize again the landowner's role. I mean, we sometimes court landowners for 20 years before the deal materializes, and it's that long relationship that may eventually blossom. I, you know, I've been doing this for 23 years, so I'm finding that's happening now where I've got landowners I've been trying to get into a site, National Historic Site or other place for decades. And they're finally, you know, um, reaching a point of willingness. So we just kind of stay after it. And you can't just, you know, bring somebody else into those established relationships effectively oftentimes. So th those are just a few answers. Okay, well, Thank Christine, thank, thanks for that. And we are at a 90 minute point for this. And so you all have been uh, both patient and wonderfully engaged. And so looking forward to what comes next in this program, but also what comes next in this webinar series. And, and, and along those lines, maybe I'll turn this over to, to, to Leslie Kane, who started us off to take us home. Sure, and um, just a, a thank you for all the participants. This has just been uh, incredible. Uh, all the presentations have been so enlightening. Can't thank you enough. And for everybody who joined, um, as I said in the beginning, this is the first of the webinar series. And I, there was a question about uh, the Forest Service, but um, as you can tell, with with 90 minutes, we were we we covered quite a bit. So we uh, have broken this up so that we actually. Um, spend a uh, similar amount of time. And I think our next webinar series is going to be um, with the Forest Service and the Forest Legacy Program. We'll move on from there. So stay tuned at Nature Conservancy for host. And again, thanks to everybody uh, who presented and uh, we will look forward to seeing your webinar. Thanks for having us. <laughs>